the Lord Christ. Amen. I want to welcome everybody here. Welcome everybody on social media. God bless you guys out there in the cyber world and bless everybody. Uh, the, the visitors we have here. My name is Stephen Rummels. I'm the pastor here of Squad Community Church, and you are welcome here in this place. Amen? Amen. And so, if you guys are just joining us and haven't been watching, you know, on keeping track of us, we are in a series called Rebuilding the Walls. Amen? Somebody say Rebuilding the Walls. What does that mean, Pastor Steve? What are you talking about rebuilding the walls? As you guys know and look around our culture and our society and even in our nation, the whole world, in fact, you can begin to notice that something is going on. Amen. You can begin just to, to get out of your house and go to Walmart. If that Walmart is still open, ours is not open. They don't vandalize that thing. And I love Walmart. I'm pretty sure they have my picture up there somewhere as a value customer. But listen, I can't go there no more. But when you go out, right, you got to go now to like North Lake or something like that or Skokie to go to Walmart, right? But listen, you go over there and you start seeing lines and things like that. You know something's going on. Everybody got masks and things like that. You look at marriage couples because they've been on lockdown for so long. They look at it, they look like they're like wrestling against each other, right? Like they're waiting for a 12-round bout against each other. They got masks that represent their attitude. And they're just looking at each other like you are the enemy. Right. There's things that are going on within our society, within our city, within our nation that you can tell that there's walls that have been torn down. There's walls that have been burned down. You look around, you can see pain, hurt, confusion, division, all type of things going on because the enemy is constantly throwing bulldozers and, and throwing all type of things to tear down and to burn the walls in our lives and in our lives all around us. And so God is leading us into such a time as this. Somebody say it's such a time as this. To talk about rebuilding the walls that God has put in our lives that we allow the enemy to tear down. And so we're in this series out of Nehemiah, examining Nehemiah, rebuilding the walls through Nehemiah. Amen? And today, as you guys see on the screen, we're talking about a message today called United We Stand, Divided We Fall. If you guys can open up your Bible to Nehemiah chapter 5. Amen. While you guys are doing that, I want to give a quote from an awesome man of God and evangelist, right? A well-known man of God in his time named D.L. Moody. Amen. D.L. Moody said this. He said, I have never yet known the spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. United, we stand. Divided, we fall. In Mark chapter 3, verse 24, it says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. In order to go into a strong man's house, the enemy must cause division within that house. He must cause the individuals within that house, husband and wife and children, to begin to go at it with each other and bring division in the midst of them. And so as they are being divided in the midst of them, he's able just to walk in freely and take what he wants. In fact, he's able to come in and rob the whole house. Rob us of our joy, peace, of our love. Rob us of the very things to which God has given us. Rob us of the very blessings to which God has placed within our lives. And so in order for him to do these things, he has to tie us up with the vision. Nehemiah was called by God to be a servant leader who leads the people of God in prayer preparations of the heart, facing fears and assembling the people of God in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, giving the rebuilders the tools to rebuild and teaching the rebuilders how to build and battle simultaneously, all the while fighting outside opposition that came with different weapons of warfare. As you guys know, last week was part two of learning the warfare, the weapons to which God has given us, rebuilders in the battlefield. Amen. And so we learned that the opposition was coming with different weapons of warfare, yet the people of God were standing their ground with hammer in one hand and sword in the other hand as a people united under God, fighting for one another. 
while gaining the advantage over the enemy as the Lord God fought for them. Right? How many people remember that? It says God will fight for us. Whenever they put off the trumpet and you heard the trumpet, you already knew that that was a trumpet to remind us that God is fighting for us. Amen? And so they were recalling that God fights for us and advancing in the building of the walls of their lives. The enemy of their souls continued to plot and wage war, deceptively and cunningly coming under the radar of unity while stirring up the vision from within. United, the people of God were able to stand, but divided, they would fall by the hands of their fellow countrymen. The enemy will engage in battle with us. If we don't know that by now, please know it today. We are in a battle, and this battle is a battle that comes mentally, it comes physically, it comes hard, it comes direct, it comes intentionally, and if we are not ready for this battle, we will lose. We would walk away from God and leave the building project undone and left for the enemy to continue to burn it up. And so what does the enemy do? He brings discouragement. He begins to catch us off guard, affecting our mental state. He will even tack with weapons of warfare that are geared to affect us physically, whether it be an injury or, or things that will go on with you that affects you uh, physically, like anxiety and fear and things of that nature. And so what happens? He debilitates the person into an inability to function and carry out one's calling and mission of both hammer and sword. So but there is another piece of arsenal that the enemy has that cripples the body of believers who are, who are called to be rebuilders at a large scale, even to the point of bringing the rebuilding project to a complete halt. That is a thing called division. Somebody say division. If united, the people of God can stand, then divided, the people of God will fall. If united, we stand. When divided, we will fall. I want to tell us that there's nothing more disgraceful, debilitating, shameful, and revolting than seeing believers divided amongst themselves. There's nothing uglier. There's nothing more distasteful. When you look back and you see Christian against Christian, Brother against brother. Sister against sister. It's a thing that the world begins to look upon and they say, and you want me to be a Christian? It's a thing that the enemy looks at and he begins to throw a fiery darts at you and begins to wage war and he laughs at us, scoffs at us, and mocks us as he divides us group by group, marriage by marriage, Co-worker by co-worker, friend by friend, he throws in the weapon of division and the people scatter. John, Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Division is not an expression of love, agape, godlike love I'm talking about, but it is an expression of the flesh and a goal of the enemy amongst the people of God. If he can divide us, then he can stop the rebuilding of the walls in our lives and the impact of the lives of others around us. We have to understand what the word of God is saying in regards to the enemy, the thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy, as we learned last week, that this thief knows about the vision. He knows about the vision to such a degree that Jesus said, listen, if Satan is divided, and he will fall, and his end has come. I want to let you know that Satan is trying to prolong his end by all means necessary. And one thing that he is good at is unity. See, he's good at unity and unifying his people as he begins to divide the people of God. The enemy always wants to do opposite of that which God is trying to do with his people. He tries to recreate things in his own image and in his own likeness. So if God is the God of order, then that means Satan is the God of the vision. And if he's the God of the vision, then his aim and his goal and his ambition is to divide the people of God. 
If I can divide the people of God while unifying my people, then I don't even have to fight against the people of God because the people of God will kill themselves. As we're killing one another, even right now, blacks against blacks, Latinos against Latinos, whites are, I don't know what whites are doing. They they don't come up on the news. Pray for the white people, right? We love them. We want them in our church. You know what I mean? But I just don't see white, they don't don't have it on the news. I, I don't see that anywhere. The only thing you see about them is that they're making money, they're on a boat, chilling, and we're just killing each other, right? Not saying it's the white people's fault, but something is, there's something going on here, amen? But listen to this. The enemy's coming to divide us. And he's coming to divide us because we make his job easier by killing each other, by backbiting and gossiping. And, and, and talking about each other and separating ourselves from each other and, and doing the things that the enemy would have us to do. Nehemiah dealt with all the outside opposition that came their way. And now he was faced with an opposition amongst the very people who he united and worked with side by side. He shows in Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 1 through 13, the cause of division. And in 14, verse 9 through, uh, through 19, what overcomes and keeps the people of God from being divided. Today we're talking about, if you guys haven't noticed, a word called division. United, we fall. I mean, sorry, united, we stand. Divided, we fall. The word of God says, now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against the fellow Jews, their fellow Jews. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others are saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get a grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood, as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to be subject, or we have we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. After being united as a people against the enemy, and for the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem the enemy began to attack from from within the walls and the people began to fight against their fellow Jews. This was a battle that was going on now, not against the enemy. No, it was a battle going on against one another. It was a battle that the enemy started behind the walls of the children of God. Right now, there are battles going on within your walls right now. And they are there for a purpose to divide. Husband against wife. Wife against husband. Son against mother. Mother against son. Daughter against father. Father against daughter. And the list can go on and on and on. There is a battle going on within your life right now. And it's to cause you to have division and have a mindset that is of slavery and bondage. That would only promote more division. We see it in our in our country. We see it in our society. We see it in Chicago. The enemy, the Lord has taken us out of bondage and slavery. But yet, we have to allow God to take the bondage and the slavery out of us. When we look in our communities, especially the community that we are in right now. What we begin to see when you do evangelism and things of that nature, we go out here and we speak to people about Jesus Christ. One of the things that you will be able to notice is that although these individuals, we as a people have been set free from bondage and we live in the land of freedom, America, the greatest country of all time, free to get a job, free to educate yourself. But yet, why do people continue to just stop right there and not promote themselves? When you talk to them and you find out what's really going on in the neighborhood, It's because we have a bondage and enslaving mentality. I deserve something else. And so therefore, I'm not going to go get it. You have to give it to me. We have a people of God in Nehemiah came out of bondage under the captivity of Babylon for X amount of years. And during this time, this was the third 
exile that happened with the people of God. About 50,000 people came in this third exile as they exited out of uh, Babylon and on, the, on the King Cyrus who let them go. Only 50,000 plus people came out of millions because other individuals were just comfortable inside a state of bondage. And see, some of us, even in this place, we're comfortable in the state of bondage. We're comfortable being divided. We're comfortable with arguing with each other and allowing the enemy to have his way within us. We're comfortable in our homes. When we go on for days without talking to our spouse, we're comfortable with that. Well, that's on, that's on him. I'm just going to go on ahead and stay on my, uh, my Instagram right here. As long as that keep on popping, I will keep on talking to them. But I will not talk to her or him. And we have division inside the home. And we're comfortable with that. We're comfortable with that bondage mentality, that bondage heart. And God is saying, no, no, no. In order for us to continue on rebuilding the walls within our lives and the lives around us, we must overcome and fight against division and that amongst ourselves. And so we have the people of God going at it with each other. There were two factors that were to blame for such hardships in the land. Number one, it was a famine, a famine according to verse three. And number two, it was heavy taxation according to verse four. Some of the rich Jews took advantage of what was going on and chose to oppress the poor amongst them. What do we see going on even in the city of Chicago? You see the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor. There's an oppression going on. There's a separation going on. Heck, you can just go on ahead and just take a bird's eye view or whatever. And the way Chicago is set up is that you have you have different uh, parts of Chicago. And it's like blacks here, Latinos here, Asians here. Arabs over here, white people over here. You got all these separation going on. This is the city of Chicago. And what happens is there's only a certain amount of neighborhoods that continue to increase while the other neighborhoods, the less fortunate, the poor, continue to decrease. Why is that? It's set up like that. It's set up like that so the people can continue to live under division. Because united we stand. Divided, we fall. And so the rich began to take advantage of the poor amongst them. There were some who did not own any fields and had to buy their grain in order to stay alive. There was others mortgaging their fields, vineyards, and homes just to get grain during an apparent famine. So what was happening is they were trying to buy, they wanted to buy grain so they could uh, plant it inside their vineyards and grow some food so they can eat during this famine. If you don't know what a famine is, that means that the, the, there was a time of drought in the land. There was no crops that were growing. They weren't able to eat. Food was scarce. People were running around wondering what is going on. And the only people who had the food were the rich Jews, the rich brothers and sisters in Christ at that time. And you would think, man, number one, a famine Right. A famine would bring unity. Like, dude, listen, there's a, there's a famine going on, bro. Like we all need to come together and unite so we all can eat and stay alive. Amen. We need to be united. But instead, the enemy started to sow seeds and, and plant vineyards of his own within the lives of the people, the rich people. Right. Who end up saying, no, no, no. This ain't a time to unite. This is a time to cash in. This is a time to come up. This is a time to take advantage, man, because during this time, man, we're going to get richer. And we see it happening all the time. We see it even happening in our communities, in the city of Chicago and in our nation. And so instead of coming together and being unified, they began to give their fellow Jews heavy taxation. And they took advantage of the situation. And so there were some. Some were giving out mortgages, you know, giving out their fields and vineyards and homes just to get grain and a parent famine, right? While still others could not afford to pay tax, uh, to pay the king's tax, but had to borrow money to make their payment for the fields and vineyards, and that with heavy interest from their fellow Jews. Why is that important? Because these individuals, are they, can't, they don't even have enough money to pay for the tax that was due to the king on their homes. The things that they own, just like we pay tax in America, right? You got a house, a home tax and tax for everything these days, right? We got to pay that to Uncle Sam. So these individuals couldn't even pay, afford to pay the tax. So they had to borrow money from these rich Jews and the rich Jews took advantage again and they say, yeah, we'll borrow you this money, but you got to pay back X amount of interest. 
you got to pay back 12% on the dollar. You go and look at the rest of this chapter, it was 12%. 1% uh, per like month or something like that, but it totaled up a year, 12% on that. So it was like, I couldn't even pay it back. The issue with that, so we can understand, is that the enemy through division was already destroying the very future to which they were looking forward to. So it stopped them from looking ahead because they were only thinking about today and we need to get grain and food so that we can survive for today. Do you see how easy in a time like that, just like in what's happening in Chicago, man, where everybody's just thinking about the today and everybody's just trying to get their money, trying to get their dollar, trying to come up by all means necessary, even to the point if we got to kill our fellow brother, sister, or step on mama or daddy in order to get that dollar. We have a mentality of division because the enemy who comes to kill, sin, and destroy comes also to divide so that we can kill ourselves. And so Nehemiah, in chapter 5 is giving us these warnings. And so we have to ask then, what is the number one cause of division? Number one cause of division. Some of us will have different kind of answers and things like that, but there's based upon the scriptures we just read, it's one simple answer. Selfishness. Selfishness. Behind every divided home. There's selfishness. Behind every divided marriage, there's selfishness. Behind every divided church, there's selfishness. Behind every divided men, between men, there's selfishness. Between women, there's selfishness. Behind every divided thing that we can think about, if we just begin to process how the things are going and why is the vision there, there's selfishness behind it. Marriages are divorcing even today. Because somebody is being selfish. People are splitting up from their spouses from years on end. Why? Because of selfishness. People are selfish. And selfishness is the number one cause of division. So behind every division, behind every divided thing, there's selfishness. I want us to think about that. Churches right now are being broken up because of selfishness. As they continue to march on the streets, pastors and, and uh, people that are trying to do intervention to the neighborhoods and things like that. The things that stop those things is somebody decides to be selfish. Food banks are giving out food and things like that. What destroys that? Somebody wanted to be selfish. They start giving out, you know, uh, stimulus checks and, and all these other things. And then that begins to stop. Why? Because somebody was selfish. And in every down the line from the work to the home place, to family life, arguments that you're having on a day-to-day -day basis. These arguments are being, ha are being had because of selfishness. Somebody desires to get their way above the other person's way, and they become selfish. And rather than being unified, we rather be divided. I don't want to make amends with white people, because I'd rather be divided from them. We don't want Latinos and, and, and Puerto and blacks and uh, browns and blacks coming together because we need them to be divided. How are we going to continue to make money? They have to fight each other. They have to kill each other. We continue to have babies and things like that. And so what you have to do, you have to promote abortion. You got to promote selfishness because in selfishness, you will commit murder. In selfishness, you will commit robbery. In selfishness, you will commit adultery. In selfishness, you would even blaspheme God. In selfishness, money will become your God. It's selfishness that gets you moved to a place we thought we would never get. Selfishness. And so what are, the, what are some of the attributes of selfishness? I've just got a few for you guys, but the first one is on the screen. It refuses to carry the burdens of others. Some, verse 2 says, some were saying, we can and daughters are numerous in order for us to eat and stay alive. God have mercy. We must get grain. Verse 3, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. There was no food anywhere. We had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Listen to the rich people. They're Jews. They're fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Rather than helping them, 
and being a to them and loving with our hypocrisy and beginning to be a blessing rather than a curse to the other individuals. They took advantage of the fact that we have the people right where we want them. They're starving to death. And instead of giving and carrying the burden, they said, no, no, no. We'd rather be a burden. We'd rather be a burden and carry a burden. The Bible calls us to carry one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 2, the Amplified Bible says, carry one another's burden. And in this way, you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ. That is the law of Christian love. What is it to carry a burden? Some of us just think, man, I'll carry the burden, man, with, you know, I'll carry that money. Everybody want to carry the money, right? Everybody want to be a Judas and have the treasury and kind of like scheme off the top. You know what I mean? Oh, I mean, I'll carry your burden as long as your burden was become your own need. But burdens in the Bible is carrying one another's afflictions, carrying one another's sins, carrying one another's falls, carrying one another's affliction. Carrying one another's issues. It is coming along another person by definition. It is to carry a type of weight for another individual. It is to come along somebody else that when they begin to fall, you're able to catch them and lift them up. It is the ability of dying to yourself in order to serve another individual who is going through less things and unfortunate things than you are and rather give a blind eye to what's going on because their burdens is way too high for me. And not only that, but their burdens are starting to go into my pocket, which is called my wallet, my back pocket. And now it's costing me some money and I'm not willing to carry that kind of burden. And so instead, I'd rather give a blind eye. And if I do, got to give some money. You better believe you're going to pay that money back. You're going to pay it back with interest. Because not only do I want to pay it, not only do I want you to pay that money back. Oh no, but when I need you, homie, you better be there. You better bow the knee every time I see you. You better acknowledge me. You better go on Facebook, man, take a picture with high fives and all type of emojis to make sure you get everybody in your mama's attention. Just let them know a sweet little quote that I gave to you. Because in that thing, there's a dominance and there's a control. I'd rather be divided than unified. And on top of being divided, I'd rather control you than come alongside of you and walk this good fight of faith. God have mercy. And yet every day we're devouring one another. Every day we're trying to slander somebody else. Within the carrying of burdens, it's we better keep away from gossip rather than gossip and put the weight even higher. And so what happens? We begin to backbite about other individuals and the burdens to which they're going through. Rather than come alongside of them and lift them up, rather than not talk about them and be like, man, they're going through some things, let's pray about them. We rather gossip about the next individual. You see, when you begin to look at these things, you'll notice that they said, we, they said, some were saying this, some were saying that, and again, some other people were saying this. There was a lot of sayings going on for a long time, but nobody was doing anything about it. And so what does that say? Can somebody grab it? What does that say? It says this. For a certain, this wasn't happening overnight. This isn't happening just by accident. No, this was happening for a certain amount of time to such a degree. Everybody else knew what was going on except Nehemiah. Except somebody that can do something about the something that they were going through. And rather than say something, I'd rather call such and such and be like, hey, Mauricio, dude, you don't even understand what Eric's doing right now, bro. I'm so tired of this dude, dude. I'm getting so tired of it, dude. Every time, dude, they were trying to get us to go against each other, and that is what the enemy does. He finds ways to slip in to cause division because he's hoping that as you think you're unified, before you know it, as you put your guard down, I will soon divide you and have you kill him each other. Amen? And so, what is going on? What should be our response to this division and this selfishness? Be angry. Righteous anger and in, against injustice, sin, and oppression. Amen. We should be angry. We should look at ourselves and look at our families and look at our children, look at our jobs, and look at everything that's divided within our lives and the lives of everybody else, and we should be angry. 
angry to such a degree that we fight against the enemy and the righteous anger of God himself and say, no more enemy. I will not allow the vision to come into my home no more. I will not allow the vision to step into my city no more, into my community no more. I will not allow the vision to step into my marriage no more. I will no longer be your puppet. I will no longer allow the strings of the vision and selfishness to rule within my home. Tonight, I will cut the strings of the vision. And every time it tries to show its ugly face, righteous anger, build up. And you tell your spouse, Stop! The devil's trying to zap us. See, there was times that my wife and I would go at it, man. It was like man, throughout the night, and then after that, I'll pray in the morning time. I'm like, God, what in the world is going on? And it's like, well, you were selfish. Why can't she be selfish? I'm going out with God. Like, why is this? I mean, like, what is going on? You know? And then actually, you know, he starts to show me what the enemy starts to do. So I wait for my, my wife to get home, anticipating and telling the good news that God had shown me some stuff about this dude named Satan. She comes home, I look at her, I said, babe, I'm sorry. I can't go in shit for what I did. And I said, babe, listen, the enemy is trying to attack us. And we put a stop to it right there. Got a good old day, went from there. But see, we have to take a stand and be angry. And I'm not talking about no unrighteous anger because your husband keeps leaving socks all over the house and you've been told him for 10 years, pick your socks up. <laughs> Sometimes, ladies, you just got to give us grace. <laughs> Some things just will never change. Okay? Some things will. Some things will. Right? I didn't pick my socks up. But I started washing pots and pans. And so, I think one of our problems in our society is we're not angry enough. We're not mad enough for what God is doing. Amen. We're so mediocre. We'll get angry so fast at somebody else when they cross us and ours. But we won't get angry at the fact that what the devil is doing to the people of God, to those who are created in this image. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm mad. So am I. Righteous anger. The enemy is just breaking marriages, doing what he wants to do, yeah. causing our kids to get shots at the young age, causing black on black crime and brown on brown crime. And I'm not going to talk about the white people, but Asians, pray for them. <laughs> and listen, I love them too. I love them too. I don't want y'all taking a race against white people and Asians. I love yellow, green, body, all that stuff. Right? <laughs> but what I'm saying is, we have to get angry, men and women of God. We have to be angry to such a degree that we look the enemy in the face and we just don't use that saying, not today say, as just some kind of cliche. But we need to look at the enemy in the face and literally tell him in faith, not today say, you ain't taking my son, you're not taking my daughter, you're not taking my wife, you're not taking my marriage, you're not taking my neighbor, you're not taking their kids, you're not taking their dog, you're not taking their house, you ain't causing none of this stuff in my neighborhood again. Amen. We need to start looking at the enemy rather than yelling at your wife. You need to get on your knees and begin to yell at the devil that's trying to work through your wife or through your husband. We need to begin to wage war to such a degree that if we can have the audacity to get mad at God and to get mad at the one that is the flesh and the battle is not against flesh and blood, but we need to have an audacity to get on our knees and say enough is enough in Jesus' mighty name. That's what God is trying to tell us. We need to start confronting the enemy right in the enemy's camp. Right there and there. You don't wait for tomorrow. You don't wait for the nighttime. You don't wait until I get my Z's. No, you get on your knees right there and you begin to confront the enemy. Yeah. Some of y'all may think, man, I got to confront my wife because she is my enemy. I'll pray for you guys after this. Altar calls for the yoga. You may have to that. Amen? But listen, the confrontation. Some of y'all are like, man, I thank you, Pastor. You preaching this, man, because my husband, woo, I mean, you don't even know. Yeah. 
confrontation you have to have first is a confrontation with yourself. You gotta confront yourself. And how the enemy is trying to work. And then you go. The Bible says we are strength to go back and strengthen your brother. Then you go on ahead and say, hey, look, man, I've been I've been praying. I've been showing up a knucklehead. I'm sorry. Let me talk about you now. No. <laughs> they only just, after you do all that, then you can talk about and invite the other person in that thing. But see, even if that person doesn't want to talk to you, you still deal with you. You don't wait for the next man to confront themselves. You confront yourself. And you say, God, how can I stop the enemy from having his way in my home doing my part in Jesus' name? Amen. Hey, my husband want to act crazy. That's all him. But that don't mean I can't get on my knees and deal with the enemy yeah. that you get out of my home. I got the spirit of God inside of you. Amen. And so they have to rebuke and correct these people, these Jews that were doing this, right? If I can get a page of doing staying over there. And so the thing is, they have to confront these individuals. He didn't confront him lightly. He told him you must be corrected and you need to be rebuked. And he says this in verse 7 through 9. Listen to this. If I can find these scriptures. Hold on one second. Here it is. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are charging your own people interest. So I called together the meeting. You guys know what I'm talking about. As far as but he broke it down to give them an understanding. But he told them, listen, he had to tell them to his face. He says and said, he said, meaning to deal with them. This wasn't no accident. This wasn't like, I'm just going to let it slide. No, no, no. The moment he heard it, the moment is the moment he dealt with it. He began to ponder in his head. And he says, no, no, no. I need to deal with this right now. Some of us get lazy in our walk with God. Some of us get so complacent in our walk with God. And it's like, man, I don't even have the energy to rebuke and correct you. And so what do you do? You do this all the time. Depression, oppression, all these things begin to hit us from the enemy. Arguments that continue to happen in the home between child and mother, child and father, father against mother, mother against father, husband against wife, wife against husband. And this we get to such a degree. Now we rather just sit there and be like, I'm so tired of this stuff. And without realizing that what you're saying is, enemy have your way. He ties you up. And he binds you hands and feet. And he puts you in a position of tiredness as we talked about. And what does he do? Just like the Bible says, he comes and begins to rob everything that you've been working for in the Lord. And he takes it, steals it. And the crazy part about it is that you're not even fighting him. He got you tired. He has you complaining, thinking about self and selfishness. And I'd rather not confront because I'm not a confrontational person. So the man gives, takes off his jeans and gives it to the wife. And the wife puts on the jeans and gives the man the skirt. God have mercy. We have a generation of men that have become cowards. Yep. We have a generation of men of God who don't know how to be men. And they said, I'd rather not confront and stand on the word of God and do what I gotta do. I'd rather give the wife the pants and the authority that I was only given to the man who would be the head right. of the home. Right. And he attacks the head of the home. And because we refuse to confront, rebuke, and correct the enemy in our lives and say, as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. We say, listen, take my authority. I'd rather wear the skirt. I'd rather sit down and just let the devil do what he wants to do. And then the woman try to do the best they can. They like the authority. They like the cheese. It fits out real good, nice and snug. But they fail to realize you were never meant to wear those pants. Right about that. And so without even knowing it, it equates to the vision. I think of that. I said the man is the, is the household and the woman is beneath him, not in subordination, but beneath him in the sense of he must follow her with grace or lead her with grace and love Amen. and validation. But the moment we give up what God has given us, we have allowed the enemy to come in and divide us. 
because now the woman is doing the role that the man was supposed to be doing, and the man is doing the role that the woman is supposed to be doing. Because we become cowards and tired of confrontation. I'm not saying it's your fault, men, our fault. Many of us weren't even built or raised with fathers in our home. But it doesn't give us an excuse to keep on giving up. And so the next one he did, he says he gave them understanding. Listen, man, we just bought our people out of slavery. And now you're putting them back in slavery to what? For us to buy them right back out. We enslave each other without even realizing it. Putting on expectations upon a people that just came out of bondage. They were in uh, Babylon under King Cyrus for such a time. They weren't in there making money. They were in there being slaved. And so when, when Cyrus said, let, when God told Cyrus, let my people go, let them build the walls, let them build the temple, what happened? They went over there poor. They had nothing going for themselves. They went over there in faith in Christ with a vision of a future that God would give them milk and honey, a promised land in Jesus' name. And so what happened? They lost the understanding because we began to put expectations on each other that only enslaved one another. And remove the vision all at the same time. And Nehemiah is like, no, no, no. His answer was simple. Stop it. Some of us are like, man, God is working on me, man. It's going to take a little something, a little time. God is saying, stop it. Stop allowing the enemy to divide you. Stop allowing the enemy to conquer you. Stop allowing the enemy to have you sit on the bench when I called you to be a ball player. I called you to be the Jordan in this game of life. And yet you'd rather just sit on the bench and let somebody else be the Jordan in your home. God have mercy. He's giving us understanding of where we're going wrong at. We're continually slaving each other and giving each other a, a slave and bondage mentality and a slave and bondage heart. We don't even know what to do with it. In marriage, in relationships, you're calling from God himself. You're just like, I don't even know anymore, man. Some of us got calling on our lives right now because we lost the understanding. Just sitting on the bench. Some people some are supposed to go to Bible college right now. And they lost. And so the last thing he told them to do is repent. Amen. Repent. He says, and my brothers, I and my brothers and my men are also lending pe the people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. Stop it. Get back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, and olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. 1% of the money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priest. He was Nehemiah wasn't playing games. No, he's like, no, you're going to let your yes be yes. And on top of your yes be yes, you're going to make a, a declaration in the presence of God. He called the priest. Yo, Pastor Steve, come over here, bro. He's going to come to my house right now. Me and my wife, we're trying to make an agreement, but we want to make sure this agreement is before God. So we want to be, you be the witness of this agreement. Amen? It sounded like discipleship. Mm. They call Nehemiah. Nehemiah calls the priest. Like, hey, listen, man. These people want to pray. They want to repent. They want to turn from their stuff. But in order for them to keep on leading them and doing the right thing, they need discipleship. They need to repent and they need discipleship. And she says, hey, we called the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. I also shook off the folds of my robe and said, in this way, God shake out their house and possessions. Anyone who does not keep this promise. So may such a person be shaken out and empty. It was a serious promise. And they said, if you go back on this promise of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, God is going to shake you like we shake the dust out of our robes. He's going to shake you out. Remove your possessions. Shake your foundations. He said, I'm going to shake them out. In this way, may God shake out their house and possessions. Anyone who does not keep this promise, so much a person be shaken out and empty. There's people in this room right now that feel empty inside. And they're wondering, God, why do I feel 
empty, God. What is happening to me? Have you left me and forsaken me, God? Am I, have I become a reproach, God? Why do I feel so empty, God? He said you feel empty right now because you didn't do it my way. Come on now. You thought that because you did it your way, that was equivalent to my way. And your way only leads to destruction. But my way always leads to everlasting life. Why is my marriage empty? Why is my life empty? Why is my job empty? Why do I feel like I have no purpose? I have no direction. God, what is going on? And God is sitting there and he's saying, because you're trying to do it your way. Instead of Yahweh's. Trying to do it your way. And so he called the priest to keep them accountable so they could know to do it God's way. Amen. Not our way. Lord. So they had to repent and not only repent, but show signs of repentance. You call yourself a man of God, a woman of God, then let's see it by your actions. Right. You're a child of God. You made a commitment to God. We should see it by your actions. But instead, what do we see? We see selfishness. We see emptiness. We see people trying to do it their way. We get phone calls of marriages going down the drain. We get phone calls of people backsliding. Off. We get phone calls of, of people, you know, committing adultery and doing all this craziness. We get phone calls that man, my, my children are acting crazy. We get all these phone calls and all these reports and all that stuff. And then when you begin to examine the life, you know the one thing that is missing? Yahweh's way. God's way. It's missing. So how do we overcome division? Very simple, man, woman of God. Nehemiah begins to talk, and in this section 14 through 19, I don't have time to read this thing, but listen. He begins to give a testimony of himself as a governor. One thing you will know is that governors don't usually do this. They don't start talking about themselves and things like that. Well, governors in our time, they do. They got married like five new audience. That's a whole other Bible study sermon or whatever. Catch me, catch me outside or something. I'll tell you about that. Listen. He begins to tell them these things, and it's going to contrast what was going on in the world. Because the enemy was committing or causing division within our world to such a degree that we become selfish in all our ways. And God said, no, no, no. Nehemiah, I raised you up for such a time as this. I want you now to testify to the people of God what I have caused you to do. And he begins to testify. And he says, listen, for 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate food allotted to the governor. They were given special food. But guess where that special food and that liquor came from? The very people. For the very people. And so he said, no, I refuse to take that because all, all I'm doing is burdening the people even more. So I will refuse a paycheck. I will refuse to do these things instead. So I can be there for the people. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. You know, wine is a very delicate thing at that time. You go do some famines. You feel empty. Wine is a pretty good thing to take as they were taking at that time. Wine was, was a thing that helped them because water was jacked up back then. And so all the things, even the things that were there to try to give them some kind of freedom and things like that, were taken from them to tax them. And it says their, assist, their assistance also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work of this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Listen to this. Therefore, hundred. And he starts telling them what he was doing. 150 Jews came. He fed them. Whoever came from outside came in. He fed them each day an ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry or even lechon and all type of stuff, bro, prepared for me. And every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on the people. What was he saying? What is the number one overcomer of division? Selflessness. See, for some of us, selflessness is a bad word. I'm going to take this. Uh, I'm going to take this on my chin. Who deals with her? Who deals with him? 
who deals with the you want me to take this on the chin? You want me to leave vengeance for the Lord? You want me to give to my enemies of what you have given to me? You want me to pray for this dude? He's talking crazy to my wife, acting crazy with the kids, and you want me to pray for him? Yes, sir. That's what I want you to do. You want me to forgive? Yes. You want me to keep loving? Yes. You want me to keep sharing? Yes. You want me to continue to work and try to just do all these other things and pay my tithes? Yes. Even though it's Friday, God, why can't it be a Sunday, God? Because I said so. I'm God and you're not. And Nehemiah has given an example of his life. So listen. The very first thing he did or he showed was instead of being a burden to the people and not carrying their burdens, he carried the burdens of others. As we read, 1 Thessalonians 2 9 says, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, out of toil and hardship, we work night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You see, what is God saying? When you carry the burdens of other people, it is in those times that they're able to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why are my family members not getting saved? Why are people coming to Christ? Why is my marriage not turning around and God is saying, start carrying the burdens? And watch the gospel be preached in your life. Start acting like God himself. The next thing, he was a servant of all, according to verse 17 and 18. It says, furthermore, 100, 150 people who start coming in. He didn't get that from nowhere else. Out of his own abundance, he started to feed other people. His example in that thing was instead of being self-servant, he became the servant of all. He was a governor. This man was a man of authority. If you know anything about the past and the history of that, governors weren't serving anybody. They were being served. They were being served to such a degree. They were taking even more to which they were was allowed to them. They were robbing the people. And the thing is, God is saying, listen, you are robbing the people right now. Well, how am I robbing the people, God? What are you saying? Is it ties? No. You're robbing the people, though. Well, how, God? You're robbing them because all you want to do is take, take, take. What was me? Pity patty parties. Oh, when I'm jacked up, I want everybody else to be here. But the moment somebody else is jacked up, you're like, man, hey, I got to work, man. The moment a knee comes up in the church, man, evangelism is like, hey, man, we're about to evangelize somebody. Man, ain't nobody got time for that. I'm going to evangelize my bed and my seeds. My pillow is definitely going to hear the gospel tonight. <laughs> we stop doing the things of God. We stop becoming servants of all. God, why are you not using me? God, what is going on? It's like, man, you don't make yourself available. Right. Can I use you? You're just in a stance. You're stale right now. Lukewarm in your ways. We've been talking about on Wednesday. But yet he became a servant of all. Second Peter 5 2 says, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that would never fade away. If you guys can give God God's word, praise and glory, amen. These were shepherds, these were pastors, these were governors, these were people in authority. And he says, listen, don't lord it over them. Listen, be eager to serve. Be eager to listen to them. Be eager to be side by side with them. That was the example of Nehemiah. He says, no, I was devoted to building this wall with you. I was devoted to have a hammer in one hand and a sword on the other end. I was devoted to fight the good fight of faith. Not above you, not beneath you, but right next to you. I was devoted and called to be a servant of all. A servant who serves God and serves people. That's it. So that's what he was calling us to do. He didn't lord it over them. Some of us is like, listen, it's going to be my way or the highway. Some of our spouses inside the home, the reason why we're having so many issues is because it's about my way or not and in no way at all. It's the highway after that. So what happens, it breaks communication within the home. 
It causes division. It causes us to fight and to bicker. Or serving at all is not concerned with trying to make a point inside the home. They're concerned about serving the people inside the home. I'm going to defend myself. I'm not here to make a point. I am just here to serve. Can I listen to you? Can I serve you? Can I meet you where you're at? That's what Nehemiah did. He didn't load it over them. Even though he was a governor, he could have. He didn't. And the last thing, he feared the Lord. He feared God. You see, when you start getting into the vision and selfishness, you do the opposite of these things. It's not carrying nobody's burden. I'm not doing this for nobody else. I'm not going to serve them. They need to serve me. I want my voice to be heard. It's all about me, myself, and I. I'm not going to do discipleship class. I don't need none of that stuff. I'm not going to do X, Y, and Z. They're talking about that squad. I'm not doing none of this stuff. Listen, I'm on my own stuff. I'm a renegade. I'm, I'm by now. I'm a nomad. Just take me as I am type stuff. And it's like, man, but the way you are is not of God. You still want to take you as you are. God has mercy. You're my hindrance now. Carry the burdens of others, serving of all. And he feared the Lord. Look at the Bible says, man, in the latter part, 15, C and 16. He says, their assistance also loaded over them. He says, but out of reverence, reverence is another word for fear, the fear of God. But out of reverence for God. And I'll act like that. You see, some of us, man, are starting to be on approach. An approach of disgrace and dishonor. A reproach because of you're called to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, no, man, I'm going to do it my way. I'm not Yahweh, I'm going to do it my way. But no. God is saying, listen, you need to fear the Lord. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this one. Acts 20, 35 says this, and everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord himself. He said it is more blessed to give than to receive. He gave from out of his own to all who came to him. And he did it because he knew that it was more blessed to give than to receive. God is saying the reason why you can't fear the Lord because you fear an empty wallet. You fear man. You, you fear the things of this world, you you fear your boss, you, you fear everybody but God himself, you fear persecution, you fear your spouse. And so what happens, we stop going after God the way we used to, we start being cold and against God and we lose the fear of God inside of us because we start fearing everybody around us. So if we can stand right the last thing Nehemiah said was this. To show him all these other things, he said this. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. Everything Nehemiah did, he did unto the Lord. He lived as an example of the Lord to the people. Why is that important? Why is the last thing he says is that in regards to his life and everything he was doing? Why is that? He's trying to show us, man. The reason why we can't do the radical things that we think are radical that God is calling us to do is because we're so busy looking at ourselves. We're so busy wanting to do me. We're so busy doing YOLO. We're so busy being selfish. We're so busy just being busy. But he did everything unto the Lord and he lived as an example of the people, of the Lord to the people. And he said, remember my favor, my God, for I have done for these people. He says, even I'm doing these things and you guys are seeing me, I'm carrying the burdens of the people. I'm being a servant of all. I'm walking in the fear of the Lord. And why am I doing these things? Not so that people can remember me. Not so that people can exalt me. Not so that people can give some, some kind of gratification. No, I do it because I want the Lord to remember me. The Bible says do all things unto the Lord because it is him to whom we serve. How can you submit to your husband? How can you come in agreement and love your wife and respect your husband? Do it unto the Lord. How can you carry the burdens of the next man and all these other things? You do it unto the Lord.
Lord? How can you become a servant of all? You do it unto the Lord. How can you fear and walk in the fear of the Lord? You do it unto the Lord. And so tonight, you choose to rather be united and stand than to be divided and fall prey to the enemy's schemes. If you have been selfish in your ways and have been the cause of the vision that affected others, would you repent unto the Lord and start being an agent of unity and not division? And lastly, will you start being selfless and reflect Christ out of reverence for Christ? Can we all bow our heads today? Father in heaven, God, we pray right now, God, and we ask Jesus that you would be with us and that you would keep us, God. Father, we ask for forgiveness of our sins, Lord God, that we have done against thee, Lord. Amen. God, everyone.